the hour of 1015 uh, having arrived, I will call the tax committee to order. We do not have a quorum, so I'll officially call it to order when we do have a quorum. Uh, a couple of things we'll go over and we, well, I'll, I'll wait uh, on a few items here until we get a few more members here. Uh, but we'll start out, uh, if you look at your agenda, we have introductions, but there's not that many to introduce themselves yet. So we will go right to House File 132 and uh, we will hear that. I will officially move the bill uh, for Representative Rosenthal when we do have a quorum. Uh, so hopefully that will happen uh, quickly here. Uh, so Representative uh, Rosenthal, uh, if you could please come to the table with your witnesses and present House File 132 and I will officially move it before us as soon as we have a quorum. Uh, welcome to the Tax Committee, uh, Representative uh, Rosenthal. Uh, if you could please uh, inter er, introduce your bill and uh, your testifier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members. House File 132 is pretty straightforward. Um, as many of you know, I come from a financial background. And what House File 132 attempts to do is uh, make bullion, um, which is now taxed at 7%, in Minnesota, um, we're looking to repeal that tax because it really is an investment vehicle these days. It's just like buying a stock or buying an, uh, an option or a bond or, in my case, a currency. If Today, if you go to buy bullion, um, you're automatically at a 7%, uh, you're 7% behind the ball. And uh, I certainly wouldn't buy a stock that was 7% uh, as a loss as soon as I bought it. Um, so I think that this is a very good way to keep uh, not only a good investment, but investments f coming from uh, Minnesota businesses. Because currently, they can buy gold out of state without the tax, which really penalizes uh, our local businesses. And uh, with that said, uh, I'd be happy to answer questions, but I think I'll turn it over to the testifier. Okay, thank you, Representative. I will officially call the meeting of the House Tax Committee to order. Uh, I will move House File 132, and then Representative Rosenthal, what we'll do is this would be one later for possible inclusion in the omnibus tax bill. Uh, so with that being said, uh, just a couple of things, a couple of housekeeping things here. We don't spend a whole lot of time on this. Uh, first of all, we'll, we'll do introductions when we get done with today's business here. Uh, every, hopefully everybody will be here at that point. Uh, as far as committee rules, members, uh, we have none. Um, <laughs> Well, I should say we have one. Um, okay, so no rules to look at. I mean, we know how committees work. This is, uh, these are folks that have been around a while that are on this committee. Uh, as far as if you can't make a meeting to be excused, uh, you don't have to do that. We will automatically excuse anybody that can't make it to a meeting. We're not going to play the gotcha games with that. Uh, so, you know, really, if you think about it for just a second, if somebody misses a tax committee meeting, it's, it's really there. Uh, unfortunate situation, not ours. So, uh, with that being said, uh, Ed, I have moved House File 132, uh, and the motion will be at the end of the testimony to lay it over for possible inclusion. If you could please introduce your uh, witness. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Rosenthal, and committee members. My name is Gary Adkins. And I'm here to represent uh, collectors, and consumers, and, and businesses here in Minnesota that deal in precious metals. I want to thank you for this opportunity to talk about precious metals bullion investments and why they should be exempted from sales tax. Right now, consumers can purchase uh, precious metals futures contracts, exchange traded funds, mutual funds, and other precious metal investment vehicles without paying sales tax. Physical precious metals are directly equivalent to these investment products but are subject to sales tax. With physical possession of the metals, you have control. It's not a paper guarantee. The investment impact of these products are, uh, is that they are monetized or legal tender issues. And if you think about that, consumers are basically paying tax on money. More importantly, when consumers purchase bullion coins, their investment takes a loss in excess of 7% upon completion of the transaction if they purchase these products from Minnesota dealers. Large investors will simply purchase from a tax-exempt state. Small investors, however, who can only afford a limited amount are hurt by the, the most by being penalized over 7% on their investment right out of the gate 
and they may not qualify for other precious metal investment vehicle accounts. Uh, there are 31 other states right now, including Iowa and the Dakotas, uh, who have exempted precious metals from their sales tax. Two more states, Virginia and Indiana, are considering the same legislation this, re this year as well. We're losing millions of dollars in any given year in convention revenue by having this tax. Uh, one of the largest uh, organizations in the country, uh, investment organizations and collector organizations, the American Numismatic Association, has about 30,000 members and they bring about $10 million in revenue to, to the states that they go to every year to hold their convention. They won't come here with the sales tax uh, in place as it is now. It's also a, a major consumer protection issue because along with the, uh, the other factors we've talked about, uh, consumer protection is probably a key element. Many large out-of-state companies offer these products on TV, radio, and other media, and the approach generally is to upsell consumers when they call in. Uh, they try to uh, uh, roll them into higher profit margin items and using bait and switch and fear tactics like gold confiscation as their sales tool. With the new Minnesota regulations on precious metals dealers that was passed last year, Minnesota consumers are now protected and we can expand uh, sales here in Minnesota as well as to other states because now Minnesota is a model state. We're the only state in the, in the entire country that has uh, precious metal dealer regulations in place to regulate this, uh, this industry. When the Attorney General pushed for these regulations two years ago, her staff stated that more than 50% of the complaints they received were from out-of-state uh, dealers uh, who were misrepresenting products or not delivering products to Minnesota consumers. This legislation will give Minnesota consumers the opportunity to build a face-to-face -face relationship with a local dealer and build a trust with them uh, give them the opportunity to buy those products and take delivery immediately uh, on the products that they're interested in purchasing. Uh, it might, it's interesting also to note that these products are all included in IRA investments according to the IRS. These can all be placed in IRA accounts um, and another difference in these, uh, for example, bullion and coins and precious metals uh, versus other uh, types of investments is that these are the only ones that can be included in an IRA account. So someone can put these in, into their uh, in retirement account. Um, we would estimate that uh, perhaps 50 to 150 million dollars <coughs> each year is leaving the state and going to other states revenue that people are buying precious metals in these kind of quantities and that money is going out of state. We would like to keep that revenue in Minnesota, build jobs here, build opportunities uh, and give consumers the opportunity and freedom of choice uh, when purchasing precious metals. Thank you very much. Thank you. Questions? Uh, Chair Knobloch. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Rosenthal, I uh, like this bill. I think it's a good bill and I applaud you for bringing it. But I guess I've got a question. I Does this cover bullion itself? I mean, if someone buys a uh, 10 ounce uh, brick of gold uh, in Minnesota, are they also exempt from sales taxes? I'm reading it, I'm thinking it only covers like gold coins. Mm -hmm. Mr. Atkins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Knobloch, uh, Representative Knobloch. Um, this right now, the way that the uh, coin dealer legislation that was passed last year is, is defined, bullion is, has a very broad definition. We're gonna, we actually have a meeting with the Commerce Department tomorrow to narrow the focus of that so that bullion is more clearly defined uh, that being things like uh, American gold eagles or maple leaves or, um, you know, Krugerrands or silver bars. We're going to define that more succinctly and hope to get that uh, uh, change into our legislation. Uh, thank Chair you. Knobloch. The gentleman from Lyon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a kind of a general question. Um, you kind of touched on a little bit with the kind of the definition side. Um, I know a lot of folks... Uh, uh, within the industry, maybe do a little refining themselves. They maybe buy scrap and then they refine it. And if they were to put it into a, a kind of a, a brick form, or, or a, uh, it, would they be covered under this, or would they have to have a, a more of a factory kind of oriented coin mint? Um, I also appreciate the bill. I think it's a good bill, but just trying to look for some clarification. Representative Rosenthal. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and Representative Swadinsky. Um, it's my intent for the way this bill reads now is not uh, how I would like the final bill to read. Um, I think it needs to be um, in the 90% pure bullion range to really make effect. And uh, I think I didn't have time to make that amendment today. 
but going forward, um, I certainly would think that makes a lot of sense. And whether outside dealers can uh, um, melt down gold and sell it, um, that's something I haven't thought about, but I think it's a really good point and we need to, to pay attention to it. The gentleman from Lyon. So is your intent then to be like uh, to cover, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, like uh, junk, silver coins and things like that, as they would say, for 90%? Representative Rosenthal. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative. Uh, junk silver, certainly, but um, definitely gold. Um, okay. That's the primary investment. And as somebody said, the, um, there are different percentages in gold bullion, and I think we need to define a, a floor for that. Okay. So um, I'm looking at something in the 90s. All right. Uh, Representative Ansels. <coughs> thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. and. Uh, to the author, I I uh, I think this is a really horribly bad idea. Um, I can't tell if we're uh, doing something for uh, investors or collectors. And uh, for our first bill out of the chute to be something that gives a tax break to uh, gold and uh, precious metals uh, citizens is pretty outrageous, I think. And uh, terrible message uh, that this committee is sending to the people of Minnesota. What if we include copper and nickel? Th thank you, Representative Ansel. Uh, members, if you would please look in your packet on House File 132, please take a look at the revenue estimate uh, that you, everyone should have that. Uh, Representative Earhart. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just curious for Mr. Atkins, uh, what's got uh, the price of crude oil have to do with the price of gold and silver as indicated in the revenue note? I mean, uh, is, has uh, the price of gold fallen uh, for precipitously as gold as crude oil has, or what? Uh, Mr. Atkins. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative. Um, crude oil and oil, or excuse me, crude oil and gold and silver prices are somewhat related, but uh, crude oil, as you know, has fallen dramatically. It's in the mid forty dollars a barrel right now. Gold and silver have maintained uh, their pricing. Uh, uh, for the past six months anyway, they've been in a relatively small trading range. So it does affect, uh, you know, that, that uh, area, but not, uh, not dramatically. And, Senator and, Hurt? No, thank you. Okay. Representative McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think this is a great bill. Anytime the state, we, we have an opportunity to reduce or eliminate a tax is a great idea. So thank you, Representative, for bringing that to our committee. A question for you, the data that you passed out signifies that uh, conservative estimates are that we could be losing or leaving uh, over $50 million of revenue. Uh, how do you come to that uh, information to us? Mr. Atkins. Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, Representative McDonald, thank you for that question. Um, it, it's fairly simple. I've, I've done uh, some survey work with some of the larger bullion, and most of the clients that come to me right now and want to uh, purchase a large quantity of uh, precious metals. I refer them to some of the larger companies around the country. Uh, American Precious Metals Exchange in Oklahoma is one of those. I've contacted them. They're doing millions and millions of dollars worth of business here in Minnesota. And basically, I, I don't feel right charging my customer another 7% to sell them precious metals when they can buy it out of state through a uh, tax exempt state and save themselves 7%. So I'm getting that data from companies that I know that are doing business here in Minnesota, taking that money out of our state. Well, the old saying that my father would say, if you want more of something, lessen the tax. If you want less of something, raise the tax. So this will be a tax, a revenue, rather, for the state. So uh, you got my support. Representative Loeffler. Um, well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I know it's um, tough to enforce. But um, a question for staff. Isn't it true that we have a use tax that if you purchase things that are taxable, um, and have it delivered here to Minnesota, you are expected to pay our sales tax and have a legal obligation to do so? That's correct. Uh, Mr. Michael. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, yes, that is that is correct that there is a use tax that applies. There is a de minimis exemption so that if you, I, I think it's $770 or something like that if you're annual purchases of all things that would be subject to the use tax 
from somebody who does not have the requirement to collect the sales tax that does not apply. So in theory, somebody could be buying small amounts of bullion coin from out of state sellers and not have a use tax obligation. But if they're buying larger amounts or have other purchases that get them over that threshold, they would have an obligation to pay. Of course, the difficulty that you all recognize is that it's very hard for, first of all, compliance is very low and it's really not feasible for revenue to actually go out and audit and find people to get them to pay that tax. Um, thank you. And the other question was um, on the, the profits on this, if gold were to go up or whatever precious metal you invest in, is that subject to capital gains then? Because it's being compared to other investment streams that people diversify into. Mr. Michael. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Loeffler, yes, the, the capital appreciation of it, this type of investment when it's sold would be subject to capital gain tax. At Minnesota, there's one capital gain tax that applies to all long-term capital gains. At the federal level, there's a differential rate that actually to, for collectibles applies a higher rate. So these investments would be they're not as tax preferred as investing in a stock or bond because they're subject to that higher collectible capital gain tax rate. And of course, as the witness pointed out, they also qualify to be put into retirement accounts, in which case they're taxed as ordinary income. The gain on them would be taxed as ordinary income. Thank you. Representative Loeffler. Thank you. Okay, with that, uh, there are no further. Oh, yeah. Uh, is there anyone in the public who would like to testify on this bill or make some comments before the tax committee? Okay, with that, we will lay House File 132 over for possible inclusion in the Omnibus Tax Bill. Thank you, Representative Rosenthal. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Atkins. Thanks Thank for being, you. coming to the tax committee. Okay, you'll notice, um, well, a couple things here. Let's go to uh, House File 6. Uh, that's a Davids, Lincheski, Draskowski, Anderson, Hortman bill. Who would ever want to vote against that would be uh, with that. Uh, again, for now that we have a lot of members here, I just want to repeat a couple of things here, if I might. Uh, as far as committee rules, we don't have any. Uh, as far as needing to be excused from tax committee, you don't need to be excused. We will excuse you if you don't show up for meeting. And like I said, if you don't show up for a tax meeting, it's your loss, not ours. Um, and there will be no seating arrangement. You can, uh, we don't have any assigned seating. Okay, so with that being said, let's, uh, I will move house file number six. If we could have the testifiers come down. And I believe that we have uh, the Department of Revenue. And we have, I have on my list a Todd Cook and a Paul Egger. Are there other folks in the audience that would like to testify? And members, just to be clear, it's my intention uh, to uh, hear this bill. Uh, and then I have an amendment, which is House File 27, which was heard in the Garofalo and Representative Garofalo's committee, Chairman Garofalo's uh, committee yesterday, uh, and passed out of there. Uh, and then it would be my intention to have a vote on it. And then that, I don't know how it will debate both bills here, but we'll start out with House File 6. Uh, and if uh, the new Commissioner of Revenue could introduce herself to the committee and, and welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning and members of the committee. Thank you for this invitation this morning to talk about this important topic for Minnesota. Um, my name is Cynthia Bowerly. I am honored to serve as the Commissioner of the Department of Revenue, which is a fine agency, and to follow my friend and mentor, Myron Franz, in this role. As this is my first time before you, I appreciate the opportunity to introduce myself to you. I joined Revenue last year as deputy, having previously served at Deed as deputy. I grew up in Benton County. My family had a road construction business, and my uncle Jerry Bowerly had the privilege of serving four, year, four terms in the late 80s and 90s in this body. I attended high school at St. Cloud Cathedral and received my BA from Concordia College in Moorhead, along with Mr. Rubis. So, Commissioner, you're a cobber? Uh, yes, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. I think in your, as you prefer, I was a crusader in high school, a cobber, and then a Hoosier. I did go to Indiana University for my advanced degrees. I did see that. <laughs> just, just a second here. Before you continue, uh, just remember, uh, committee members, some of you haven't served on taxes before. This is not a committee. This is an adventure. 
<laughs> with, with that being said, who's sitting? Could you introduce the person sitting next to you? Absolutely. Um, my apologies, Mr. Chairman. Next to me is uh, Paul Cummings. Many of you know him. He is our. Uh, we promoted him last summer to our manager for tax policy. He has been uh, with the House in, in his prior work and been with Revenue for four years. And it is my privilege and my benefit to work with him and have him uh, work with all of you as well. Commissioner, what's the next step up the ladder from his current title? Uh, it, it would be deputy. Things are looking bright. And, and, and uh, <laughs> right. okay, Mr. Chairman, our, our, Mr. Chairman, our, our current deputy, uh, Ryan Church, is with us today. Uh, so we, we don't have a vacancy at this moment. Nothing personal, um, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> Not, nothing personal. <laughs> but I'd watch it. Um, but I. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I understand that it is not infrequent that um, members who, that individuals who serve in Paul's role do uh, get promoted at the pleasure of the chairman, so we will consider that as, as necessary. Um, well, at Concordia, I also had the opportunity to work with one of your, a former colleague of yours, uh, Representative Maury Lanning. I got to know him as Dean Lanning, Dean of Students, and his work as advising the student government organization, which is a part of. And it is also my understanding that uh, there's a particular requirement, although I understand there are new rules, uh, it is strongly urged that freshman members of the committee uh, bring uh, treats as they're presenting a new bill. In that spirit, as, although I'm not a member, obviously, as someone new to the committee, I have brought treats to share. Mm. Mr. Chairman? They I come will... up here first. <laughs> <laughs> Please approach the bench. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Very well done. Uh, thank you. Uh, as I said, I have a very good uh, advisors. So uh, we really do appreciate you hearing uh, federal conformity uh, early. It is important to Minnesota taxpayers. It is important to the department. And I really want to express my deep appreciation to you, Mr. Chairman, for the efforts that you have made in getting this bill um, set up for, for swift proposal. As, as you mentioned, I think warp speed was the term you used, and I think we are seeing evidence of that. So thank you so very much. Uh, the bill you have before you proposes to incorporate changes made to the Internal Revenue Code on December 31st of 2014. Uh, these are provisions that, that the Congress passed at the end of, year, of last year. Uh, it is something that this committee and the state has done uh, frequently to conform changes uh, to the federal tax code. Uh, the bill proposes to adopt all the changes in, uh, in the tax code that were passed, including a few amendments to the FAA Modernization and Reform Act of 2012, which were included in Representative Klein's Pension Reform Bill, and tax treatment for achieving a better life experience accounts, which are new tax advantage accounts for the benefit of certain blind or disabled individuals. While the bill would conform Minnesota tax treatment of ABLE accounts with the federal treatment of those accounts, it does not yet contain language creating a Minnesota ABLE program. I understand that would be separate legislation that would need to move. The IRS has indicated that it will be promulgating regulations on ABLE accounts in the next few months. The bill before you would benefit a number of taxpayers. It includes deductions for higher education for tuition expenses, mortgage insurance premiums, teachers who pay for supplies out of their own pockets, as well as exemptions for IRA distributions made directly to charity. Without conformity, taxpayers would need to file an additional form and would not be able to make these adjustments to their income. The bill would also adopt a number of federal changes to depreciation schedules for certain industries. Businesses, whether they're small industrial firms buying equipment, film and television production, restaurant and retail property, or mines expensing their safety equipment, taxpayers deserve simplicity of how to track their investments over time. This set of provisions is a package. It was passed by Congress after much debate about which provisions and how long they should be extended. We recognize that some of these may enjoy more or less support, and there may be interest in uh, providing for longer term uh, benefits for Minnesotans. But this is the set that Congress has passed, and it will provide Minnesotans with significant benefits if we can act quickly. As you may know, the department has announced that we will open for state income tax filing on January 20th. This is the same date as the IRS, and this is for individual income uh, filing. For the benefit, convenience of taxpayers, we are asking you to send this bill to the governor by that date. And I appreciate again, Mr. Chairman, all of your work to do so. We open Minnesota's filing season on the same day as the IRS for a number of reasons. 
first because federal income is the starting point for state income. It's the easiest and most accurate way for taxpayers to complete their returns at the same time. <coughs> We are also linked to the federal system through ele the electronic, modernized electronic file, or MEF in the parlance. This link combats fraud and is the most efficient way for us to process returns. And finally, if we don't open the electronic system at the same time, individuals may turn to filing their state income on paper because it can be mailed through the U.S. Postal Service at any time. And an increase in paper filing would overwhelm our processing capacity and result in significant delays. And so we will open on the 20th as the IRS is going to as well. In addition to the tax benefits that this law provides for Minnesotans, this bill also provides, provides needed simplification for taxpayers. When we don't align with the federal changes, Minnesotans would be required to file an additional form, the M1NC for nonconformity. This would be incredibly disruptive for taxpayers and tax preparers. Hundreds of thousands of taxpayers would need to file amended returns with this new form, and I know that we would all like to avoid that situation. So in closing, I would like to thank you for hearing this bill today. We are optimistic that with your help we can meet the January 20th time frame for this important bill. As this new session begins, I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for working with us on conformity, and I look forward to working with you, Chair Droskowski, Minority Leads, Lincheski, and Dabney, and all of the members of this committee, your incredibly talented staff, and our staff at the Department of Revenue to support your work on behalf of Minnesotans. As you know, the department is ready, willing, and able to provide you with any information and assistance that you may like. Mr. Chair, thank you for the opportunity to speak today and for your leadership in moving this bill forward quickly. We are happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, a couple of things, members. Uh, there were, I think it was several of us met with uh, Commissioner Franz, who was Commissioner of Revenue, moving over at MMB, and at the time, uh, Commissioner-designate uh, Bowerly, and our target date then was, it looked like the IRS was going to be at the 30th of January, so we were going for the 23rd of January. Uh, when the IRS announced that they are going to the 20th, uh, that moved things up, and so just logistically pretty tough to get something past that quickly. Uh, but hopefully all leadership corners will put this on a fast track. Uh, and so that we can move it at warp speed because we miss Monday. We're off Monday, so we need to do it uh, this week. Uh, and we want to hit, it. I want to hit the 20th. Um, and in that meeting we had, let's see, Commissioner Barley, Deputy Commissioner Cummings, uh, well, and others. Okay. Uh, with that being said, we'll open up for questions now. Maybe a question for Mr. Michael on the House Research Bill summary. It talks about extending the authority for individuals 70 and a half or older to transfer up to $100,000 from an IRA or a Roth IRA, and that's something I've always supported and members have supported. Why would they include Roth IRAs and Roth IRAs aren't taxable in the first place? Or, uh, Ms. Manzi. Why? <laughs> Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, it, I, I don't know that there's any, there, it would be an ill-advised move by a taxpayer, I think, to transfer money from a Roth IRA generally. But if, if they do, it's, uh, you know, certainly permissible and it's just never going to show up as income. And so the federal law permits that to occur and we're going to conform to it. But in, in most cases, I think probably in almost all cases, the, those transfers will come from traditional IRAs because they want to not recognize that income. So Mr. Michael in federal law says that we're going to allow a tax break on something that already has a tax break. <laughs> okay. Ms. Manzi. Uh, Chair Davids, something else occurred to me as to why a person might want to do that if they had a Roth IRA, because I think if they make the distribution to the charity from the Roth IRA, then the amount that goes to the charity would be excluded from adjusted gross income rather than being claimed as an itemized deduction for a charitable contribution. So any other tax items that relied on how much your adjusted gross income is would be more in your favor because your AGI would be lower. lower. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Questions, uh, Representative Dabney. Thank you, Mr. Oh, 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. And this actually is I, yeah. on this topic. The contribution, so you got it. Yeah. We're wrong. I'm wrong. <laughs> oh, well, well, it's unusual enough to note. Um, on House File 6, uh, I, I think a question from Mr. Michaels, Mr. Chair. Uh, page 4, line 35 refers to an airline payment amount. Uh, and I'm, I'm just not familiar with that terminology. I assume this is not limited to folks uh, using the uh, old Northwest Airlines uh, credit union. Uh, can you just explain that? Well, airline Mr. payment Abby, amount? I think that's what it is. Or is Mr. it? Mr. Michael. Is, is this limited to the airline industry, or is that a term of art? I guess that's my actual Mr. Question. Michael. Um. Mr. Chairman, Representative Dabney, this is a special provision for air, employees of airlines that went through bankruptcy that allows them, a, as part of the <coughs> bankruptcy settlement, they are allowed to put money in an IRA on a tax exempt basis. And Congress extended the period of time to do that. And what this does is to extend that same treatment for Minnesota tax purposes. And so, yes, it really does only apply, I think it's primarily, it maybe exclusively to pilots. Okay. So it will affect, uh, there was a, originally we conformed to this uh, a year or two ago that affected Old Northwest mm -hmm. and now Delta pilots. There was, they've added, Congress added American Airlines and then extended the period that would affect Delta pilots and so, this keeps everything on the same basis for Minnesota tax purposes, so they would not have taxable IRA amounts that would not, honestly, it really wouldn't work uh, because, you know, the accounting would be all, would be different for Minnesota versus federal purposes, so. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, it, it's good that we don't have any rules in this committee because uh, I never moved the bill. Uh, I recommend that House File 6 is amended it, as that'll be the motion I make, but I'm going to move House File 6 be before us at this time. And just so you know, the motion will be to move it to Ways and Means is where it's headed, but uh, we will uh, move it as amended if it gets amended. Okay, Representative Garofalo and then Earhart. Representative Garofalo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and for staff. Can they please, on uh, page 3 of the fiscal note, or the revenue note, the bonus depreciation in Section 179 expensing? Can you just um, can you cover why we're seeing revenue gains and um, some of those for the accelerated depreciation, Mr. Michael? <coughs> uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, e essentially Section 179 allows expensing of capital investment by qualifying businesses that make uh, uh, smaller amounts of investment, and so they're deducting the amount that they invest in the year that it's it's claimed. Bonus depreciation is similarly an accelerated allowance for capital. It's 50% rather than all of it, and it, but it applies to all businesses. What Minnesota has done for many years going back to, I think, Ms. Manzi can correct, but I think 2006 or 2005, I remember it was when Representative Prinky was chair of the committee, we used to always conform to those federal amounts. And so when a qualifying business made a Section 179 investment, they got their expensing deduction for both federal and Minnesota purposes. Because of the budget situation at the time and the cost of that, uh, the decision was made to not conform but to, but to have a simplified method of allowing that expensing and the way it's done is that they're allowed to essentially deduct 20% in the year they make it, and then the remaining 80%, so they it functionally, mechanically, the way it works is they compute FTI, federal taxable income, by deducting the full amount of their investment for a 179 in investment in the year they make it. For state purposes, we take that amount, and then we tell them, add 80% of that back, and you will deduct that remaining 80% in equal payments in the next five years. The alternative, if we had just not conformed back in 2005, 2006, would have then varied that based on the life of the property. Some of this property may be three-year property, some of it may be five-year, some of it may be eight-year, and so then there would be different schedules. And so the idea was that even though we're not 
being as simple as we could by exactly conforming to federal law the way we did, this is an easier method than having two sets of books that varies with the life of the asset. And so, so what happens is because there's that 80% add back in the year the investment is made, it shows up as a revenue gain. But then we have a revenue loss in the next five years when that property is then later on deducted. So when you look at the, the revenue estimate, you will see, hey, this is gaining revenue in the current year, but then we're losing revenue over the next uh, five years. And for some taxpayers analyzing it economically, this, the state tax provision may still be better than just nonconformity because this may have been eight year property or longer life property, but for some others it may not be. Representative Garofalo. Thank you. Representative Earhart. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have two questions. I thought we had passed the exclusion for discharge of indebtedness on principal residents for 2014 last year. Was that bringing it up to date for 2013? <laughs> Mr. Michael. Mr. Chairman, Representative Earhart, this is one of the, another one of those provisions that Congress has decided to, for budget purposes, <coughs> extend year by year. And so every year we have to okay. keep. This is for 2014. No, Earhart? Correct. Right. Okay. Then the other question I have, uh, since we uh, use the uh, individual retirement uh, accounts, the I IRAs, uh, as this transfer, why isn't, what's the philosophy for not including the 401s? Mr. Michael? Could we do that here as a state? Uh, but that wouldn't help this right. situation. Bruce and Verhard, we're the tax committee. We can do whatever we like. That's what I was afraid of. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Michael. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Verhard, it's, you know, I, I would have to channel the wisdom of Congress as to why they have not done it for, war, for 401ks or for 403bs or 457 plans. Um, they've only done it for IRAs. Of course, the, the answer, the tax workaround of that is that you can make a direct transfer from a 401k to a traditional IRA and then make the transfer from the IRA. So it's a little bit more of a, a pain for the people who've left their... This only applies to people who are over 70 and a half years old and have minimum distribution requirements. And I think Congress is assuming most people <laughs> have moved their 401ks, but not all of them have. Yeah. Representative Earhart? No. It, Mr. Michael, quick question here. Is it for only traditional IRAs and Roth IRAs? Is it also for simples and SEPs? Or would you have to transfer the simple and SEP to a traditional or Roth? Mr. Chairman, now you've gone beyond my <laughs> recollection of the, uh, I believe that it applies to all kinds of IRAs, but I, I would literally have to go back to the code and, and check that okay, to be we, sure. We can look that later. I'm kind of curious about that. Uh, other questions on House File 6? If not, I will move any. Oh, Chair Lincheski. Mr. Chair, thank you. The, you know, we've got the tax extenders for 14. And then I see in the bill, there's the ABLE program, which is a new program. It's not retro. And my understanding of that program that Congress passed is that we're only going to be able to provide those tax benefits if our state enacts different legislation to have that program. And, you know, I guess maybe a question for you is who is carrying that legislation that would be going to other committees? Or... I mean, Commissioner Barley, do you have anybody lined up in the House to carry that? I'm not aware. Or er, Deputy? I'll then refer for this, Mr. Cummings. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, um, I know that Senator Rest, this, the other type of legislation that um, in order to enable these type of accounts, Senator Rest is really working on that. I think Senator Rest has identified Representative Hausman as someone she might be working with in the House to carry the legislation. Um, but I, to be honest, I, uh, because those Mr. are- Mr. Cummings, I've never questioned your honesty. <laughs> because those are, because that is a bill that will primarily live in the DHS um, and Health and Human Services Committee um, and will like, and may not need to come to this committee. I know that that's something that will be um, moving in a different part. but. Mr. Chair, by passing this bill, you will be taking care of the tax treatment of these types of accounts once they are enacted. 
Okay, uh, Chair Lincheski. Well, Mr. Chair, so on that, I mean, you know, that, I guess that's what I'm wondering for, for keeping track of money. Um, if that bill doesn't become enacted into law, is, is that a, a minus to the spreadsheet or a plus for the provision that's in the, and maybe that's um, Do we need Ms. Manzi or Ms. Templin or something. But. Please introduce yourself for the tape. <laughs> Cynthia Templin, House Fiscal Staff. Um, Mr. Chair, Representative Lancheski, I believe the question is if um, the if the proposal, if House File 6 is enacted with the ABLE provisions, what happens um, in terms of the revenue impact? Um, the, the House tracking sheet would continue to carry the ABLE legislation as a, a revenue reduction. Um, and then um, it, um, say the bill passes before the forecast Again, the um, tracking sheets would be incorporated into the forecast, the revenue impact. If there is no authorizing legislation for establishing an ABLE program or for the state to contract with an ABLE, for the state of Minnesota to contract with another state for an ABLE program, then um, if nothing is enacted at the end of the session, in, um, in um, consulting with uh, Minnesota management and budget, I think the approach might be that what would occur would be a forecast adjustment at the end of session. Okay. Chair Lincheski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Other questions uh, on House File 6? Uh, we have two people that uh, would like to give very extremely short testimony <laughs> on this. Uh, uh, Mr. Cook and uh, Mr. Egger, if you could please join us. <laughs> Okay, uh, Mr. Egger, state your name for the record, please. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair. My name is Paul Egger. I'm Vice President of Governmental Affairs for the Minnesota Association of Realtors. We're a business trade association that represents the approximately 17,500 realtors throughout Minnesota. Um, thank you for the opportunity, Mr. Chair, to provide very brief testimony uh, in support of House File 6 uh, here today. Uh, Mr. Chair, in addition to the, uh, our longstanding support for other homeowner tax benefits that are permanent features of the tax code, such as the mortgage interest deduction, we're also strong supporters of federal conformity. And in particular today, Mr. Chair, I just want to emphasize uh, our support for two provisions in the bill before you. The first is the mortgage debt cancellation relief provision, and the second is the extension of the itemized deduction for uh, mortgage insurance premiums. Uh, the mortgage debt cancellation relief provision provides homeowners who have had some portion of their mortgage debt forgiven uh, through, a, through a short sale, through a foreclosure, through a principal reduction, uh, some relief from having that forgiven debt considered uh, taxable income. Um, for those of you that maybe aren't, aren't so familiar with what a short sale is, this is where a lender um, approves the sale of a property for less than what the borrower owes and forgives, um, is the terminology, that portion of debt. Uh, unfortunately, the quirk of the tax code, um, if this provision isn't enacted, uh, that, that same homeowner would have to add that forgiven amount to their taxable income and be taxed on it. Um, so this Mr. is a Gregor, what, you're, what you're saying is that if somebody's like going bankrupt or something, or somebody's lost their home, and they, they have somewhat forgiven, then that has to be added back in his income. So they're broke, and now they have a huge tax liability. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chair, that's a good description of the situation without this type of provision. And, and of course, what House File 6 does, it eliminates that issue. Absolutely, Mr. Chair. And uh, just to follow up on what Representative Earhart brought up earlier, um, both omnibus tax bills moving through last year had extensions beyond uh, the retroactive 2013, but ultimately, I think, at the end of the day, the, the resources weren't available to, to make that uh, change. So we're back this year for a one-year extension. It's, it's certainly our hope, and I think most people that follow Congress and follow tax discussions at the federal level hope that um, at some point the federal government will take up a number of these provisions and make them permanent features of the federal tax code. And we'd certainly want to work with you at that time or, or at any time to make these permanent features of the state tax code. Um, and just finally, Mr. Chair, um, just want to show our appreciation, express our appreciation 
for the bipartisan nature of uh, federal conformity at the legislature. This is always a high priority, and uh, um, I think this hearing demonstrates that today. Um, in addition to the great work you're doing in this bill, um, we certainly support and encourage your continued work on addressing items where Minnesota is not in full conformity with the federal tax code, and uh, such as uh, matching federal uh, limits on itemized deductions, which um, we're at a different threshold currently, and uh, that simply um, items like that make Minnesota's tax code uh, simpler and pass along those federal tax benefits to Minnesota taxpayers. With that, I'll conclude my testimony. Thank you, Mr. Ayer. You're, you're testifying in support of the bill, so you can continue as long as you'd like. <laughs> I kept it brief uh, per your direction, Mr. Oh, okay. Th thank you, Mr. Ayer. Uh, Mr. Cook. That was great. And Mr. Cook, uh, as he comes down here, is uh, uh, with the Minnesota CPA Society. Is that correct? Now, for members, we define a CPA as an actuary with a personality. <laughs> that would be a CPA, right? There you go. I can look at your shoes as well as my own, so I appreciate that. Uh, thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chair. Uh, the, uh, my name is Todd Koch. I'm a partner at the firm John A. Knudsen and & Company and a <coughs> member of the Minnesota Society of CPAs. Um, I really look at this as a great place to start. I really appreciate that you're addressing this so soon in the session. Uh, as you know, as was said, individual tax filing season begins <coughs> next week. Believe it or not, tax returns are being filed today because business tax filing season started on Monday, both for uh, federal and Minnesota purposes. We, by addressing this as soon as you can, you're helping us reduce the overall cost of tax compliance to, to people that are not worried about what are the Minnesota rules, what are the federal rules doing part now and part later because when you, as you know, by making things inefficient, by adding extra complexity, you're adding extra cost to taxpayers, and that's just like the tax increase. So whatever we can do to help reduce the cost of compliance is great. So yes, I'm a rare bird you're ever going to hear here. I'm asking to be paid less, not more. Because uh, what we want to do here is this conformity issue at the one-page form that we talked about, that NC, is a very complex form. It looks like one piece of paper, but that one piece of paper has schedules buried behind it that, that if you're not allowed to deduct the higher education expenses, you have to recalculate your AGI, which will then recalculate your itemized deductions that are otherwise allowable on Schedule A. It is very difficult. The depreciation rules right now, uh, uh, Mr. Michaels explained well how that the adjustments work for Section 179 and bonus, but currently if I put an asset in place, if I, if I uh, do something for the landlord, uh, as a landlord for my tenant, I would have a 50% bonus reduction, so I take that over six years for Minnesota. But then the remaining difference, I take over the difference between 15 and 39 years. I have to calculate that difference for almost four decades. To, to eliminate that burden of trying to calculate a difference for four decades, to try to take the same asset under two different <coughs> modification systems would be very much appreciated. And yes, these are business provisions, but they affect your individual taxpayers, your individual constituents. Because most businesses, their income or loss flows through to people. That's why if you look at some of the differences, the corporate provisions aren't as large as the personal ones because these differences are going through on hitting people's <laughs> returns, not corporations' returns. We appreciate that you adopted conformity in the past. We really appreciate anything we can do to help reduce that, to reduce the cost of complexity is great. If you could, uh, if could form even more, that would be great, because as, uh, as the chairman said, that, that in the past we were able to adopt some of these differences, but we couldn't because of dollars. Maybe the time has arisen where we can adopt, get closer on some of these provisions. That would be great. What we, what, by doing things now, you're going to allow people to file the returns timely to get the refunds that they're entitled to. You'll help them improve their cash flow, their, their lives. You'll be able to reduce the cost to the overall, ta to the overall um, tax system because Minnesota, the Minnesota Department of Revenue won't have to recalculate refunds, won't have to re 
reprogram the computers. We'll have to chase people down to figure out if they should be sent additional funds. And I might be able to keep a couple of hairs on my head. So I would really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions for the testifier? Thank you. Okay, is there anyone else in the audience who would like to uh, testify uh, on House File 6? Please uh, introduce yourself. <coughs> Welcome to the Tax Committee. My name is Mary O'Connor. I'm from Brooklyn Center. We need to make taxes fair and simple. <coughs> By following the federal changes, we're continuing the complexity of taxes. Why not take the total gross income of each individual, subtract a personal exemption for each member of the family, and tax the rest at a lower tax rate? We could lower tax rates and still get in the same amount of tax income. Please make uh, taxes fair and simple for Minnesotans. Thank you very much. Any questions for the witness? Okay, thank you very much. So we have House file before us. There's no one else who wishes to testify uh, on the bill at this point. So I will move Amendment H0006A1. Uh, and this is uh, the amendment that was heard. Actually, the bill, House file 27, was heard in uh, Chair Garofalo's committee uh, yesterday, and I thank him for that hearing. So it has been heard in the proper committee to, to this point. Now, what, what we're doing here, and I'd like to be as clear as I can, whether you supported uh, the Destination Medical Center in Rochester or not, that is not the issue for today. What the A1 amendment does is it clarifies two points uh, in the law. And, and I have to say, uh, two years ago in 2013, there was not one person on my side of the aisle that voted for this. Uh, and so uh, that being said, we're not, I do not wish to reopen the debate on DMC, uh, substantive issues in DMC. What this amendment does is it very simply says on one issue that for, for DMC to qualify for state funds, uh, it's cumulative rather than per year. If they have to go per year, it's highly likely that they may never qualify for anything. Uh, but the legislative intent was clear. Chairman Chesky, <laughs> Chair Skoy wrote letters explaining uh, to the Attorney General's office uh, what the legislative intent was. <coughs> Uh, any f uh, revenue notes, any fiscal analysis was based upon it being cumulative, uh, not per year. So the one part of the bill says it, it clears it up, and I'm going to have Mr. Michael uh, give a description here uh, in a second. Point two, and there's about four points I look at on things that uh, we're looking at for DMC. This is, these are points one and two, which clarify for the Attorney General. And if you look at the Attorney General's opinion, uh, which was signed by Mr. Gilbert, the last sentence says, uh, and I'm paraphrasing that the 2015 legislature can clear this up or correct it or whatever the terminology was. You can take a look at that. It's the last sentence on the letter from Ms. the opinion from Mr. Gilbert. Uh, point two is allowing Rochester to use their expenditures for planning as part of their $128 million total cost. <laughs> Uh, I thought the language in Chair Chesky's bill was very clear. I, I, I don't understand, I will admit for the record, I don't understand where the Attorney General is coming from on both items, but what this does, we're not changing policy. If you want to go after DMC, you'll have your day, I'll guarantee it. Uh, th things will come up. I'm hoping that the committee uh, can support me on the A1 amendment just to clear up for the Attorney General two points uh, that the Attorney General felt uh, were not clear. Uh, and if I said anything incorrectly, Mr. Michael, please correct me uh, after committee. <laughs> no, not, not in front of the uh, But no, uh, I just want to make sure that I described it accurately <clears throat> and what, what you would have to add to what I said. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, the chair has accurately described what the, the amendment does two basic things. One is it allows that the city's cost of preparing the development plan will count as a project cost for which then it can uh, count against either its local match or use state aid to pay for those costs. 
The second thing is that it clarifies, that contrary to what the Attorney General, the way the Attorney General read the statute, clarifies that the aid computation will be made on the cumulative private investment, not the annual private investment. And that is, I think it's fair to say, what was the intent of the authors of the legislation in the 23, 2013 legislative session, that uh, it's, you know, as private investment is made each year, that gets added to the extent that it exceeds the threshold and determines the amount of aid until the city reaches the 30 million uh, maximum. Uh, if there, there are, the bill also contains some additional clarifying changes in the language that were agreed to by the city, the Mayo Clinic, uh, and, and the executive branch agencies that, that were reviewing that, that go, a little, that go somewhat beyond those two main points. But those two main points are the provisions that you know, provide the real mm -hmm. rationale for this uh, legislation. Thank you, Mr. Michael. We'll open up for questions. We'll go to Representative Lesh and the Lynchester. Representative Lesh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You referenced the letter from the Assistant Attorney General, Mr. Gilbert. Does that in our packet? I didn't see a, a copy of that letter. Uh, Representative Lesh, no, that's not. I can certainly provide it. Okay. Well, I, uh, Mr. Chair, and I, I was just advised of this in the last 24 hours as to what the dispute was, and um, I would like to see it. Um, but as I understand, we're voting on this today. Uh, and I'm and I'm curious. I'm I'm no rookie to other bodies having a different opinion on what I thought was our clear legislative intent. Um, the Timber J bill last year that we passed, I thought the legislature was pretty clear on that law. The Supreme Court thought something different, so we corrected that. Um, however, there's some pretty smart people in the AG's office too. Are they going to be here to testify on this amendment today? Uh, they're certainly welcome to. <coughs> Is there anyone here from the Attorney General's office? You certainly are well, welcome to testify. Ms. Chair, I just I no feel flesh? I feel a little bit blindsided because I really would want to know the reasons, their reasons for stating this. Um, and uh, and I, I don't feel like I can make a good decision without having that. So maybe if that, if nothing else, if we could at least get a copy of the letter uh, prior to a vote on the amendment, that would be helpful to me. Uh, can we do that quickly? What, I, I tell you what, I've got something better than the letter. Uh, we'll, we'll get it for you, probably not before the vote, but I'd like Mr. Michael to describe what the Attorney General's concerns were. Um, Ill-advised concerns, I might add. Um, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, as I stated before, the essential disagreement about reading the language related to the issue about whether the aid would be calculated based on annual expenditures or based on the cumulative amount of expenditures. What the Attorney General focused on was the definition. If you look at the, the provisions of Representative David's amendment on page 3, lines 3 through 11, there's a definition of qualified expenditures. That amount is an annual, clearly is an annual amount before you look at the changes that are made in the amendment. The Attorney General focused on that and said, okay, this is an annual amount. Then they went down and looked in what's section 9 in the amendment to the aid calculation. And the aid calculation there says the amount for the, of the aid for a fiscal year equals the sum of the qualified expenditures. They were sort of confused, I think, by the fact that the language, the sum of, was put in the law to say that, okay, the definition of qualified expenditures is an annual amount, but to get the aid calculation, we add all of the qualified expenditures, meaning all of those for the years up until this aid calculation is being made. They looked at that and, and sort of said, well, it's ambiguous, and I, and I would, you know, grant that you can characterize that as ambiguous. And they concluded that, no, we're not going to rely on that, those words, the sum of, 
to get to this mathematical calculation where we add each year's uh, qualified expenditures to get the total in calculating the aid. Instead, what we think is the legislature just meant the qualified expenditures for that prior year. And to be honest, they looked at the bill summary and they listened to testimony. And because the bill summary and the testimony was sufficiently general that it never got down to that, gee, exactly how is this mechanically going to be calculated, they concluded that it's an annual amount. However, as you know, the fiscal analysts can testify when the fiscal note was prepared by MMB and all of the spreadsheets that were being worked with by staff, those had formulas in them that used a cumulative amount. And so that's what the assumption was of the authors and the <coughs> proponents of the bill is that it would be a cumulative amount and not the annual amount. And this make it makes a big difference in how quickly the aid is paid and how reliable the aid is. And just to illustrate, for example, if you, if you use annual amounts, and this is the qualified expenditures are the amount of <coughs> private real estate investment in this area of the city of Rochester. If in one or two years, for example, because there's a recession or there's a real estate downturn, there isn't any building activity in Rochester in that year, there would be no aid paid in that year. And of course, the rationale for this aid is to provide a flow of state <coughs> revenue to the city of Rochester to help it pay for debt that it issues to build public infrastructure. Things like parking ramps, transit, highway, uh, highway and road improvements and that, and that nature of things. And so uh, as a practical matter, and this is you know, the reason why the calculation was cumulative, they wanted to have a reliable, sm smooth flow of aid. But the Attorney General was just looking at that definition of what's a qualified expenditure. And then they looked at the carryover provision and they said, well, if it's cumulative, it really doesn't make sense that there would be any carryover because there's no need for a carryover with a cumulative calculation. But what they didn't take into account on that was that the carryover was designed to say that in a year in which the city may not have made the required local match, and therefore doesn't get the aid because they didn't make the local match, then that amount carries over and the bill clarifies all of this stuff in a more specific way. But uh, basically that's, Representative Lash, sort of what this dispute is about. Is this a, a aid that's based on, gee, what happened in the prior year in terms of real estate investment in the city of Rochester? Or is it about what's happened in real estate investment in the city of Rochester since the bill was passed in 2013. Well, Mr. Chair, thank you for that. And, um, you know, with, with, with due deference to um, Mr. Michael's explanation um, and respect for his position, I was looking for either the, from the, from the words from the Attorney General, um, uh, and what I got was a, a cursory um, explanation of the Attorney General's dispute and then a rebuttal as to all the reasons why they're wrong, which I understand um, is, is the direction you want to go, Mr. Chair. Um, and it may, be, it may be the direction that we want to go as a committee, but um, Mr. Chair, this is, this is the largest amount of money this, the state of Minnesota has, has spent. Um, so I think it's a pretty big deal, and I feel like uh, it's worthy of of more information, and um, this was just handed to me by staff, and it's 17 pages, and I, I did get a copy of the letter here, but it's, it's a pretty heavy letter. So um, I just wanted to state that, uh, Mr. Chair, I, I, I kind of feel like voting on this as an amendment um, without having a, a full hearing on it uh, is, is difficult for me. So I wanted to note that for the record, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Lesh. And of course, the Attorney General's office had every I mean, these issues were posted on a timely basis, so if they want to be there, they certainly would be. I do have a question for Commissioner Bowerly. 
uh, if you could come down and we have Ms. Lamb, Kathleen Lamb, uh, to answer questions as a resource person here representing DMCC and the EDA in Rochester, EDA? Uh, the Destination Medical Center Corporation and EDA. Okay. Why don't you fully introduce yourself for the record and, and as a resource person we can ask her questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Kathleen Lamb on behalf of the Destination Medical Center Corporation and Economic Development Authority. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Bowerly. I don't think that in committee we can say what the governor wants, so we won't do that, but what do, what do you want? <laughs> well, uh, Mr. Chairman and members, thank you. Um, I also might, uh, if, it, if it's okay with the uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, ask my colleague from DEED, uh, who also is very interested in this bill. I know that the clarity uh, is very important. Uh, both to the community in Rochester, uh, but the governor also is, is, is supportive of moving this quickly and of uh, clarifying this. Um, I think uh, revenue doesn't have a particular position on this uh, because it doesn't have tax implications, um, but I do think that the administration is supportive of making this clarification. Okay, thank you. And Representative Lesh, to your point, your point is well taken, although, you know, everything has been posted properly and so forth. But that being said, uh, this, it would be my intent to amend this on, get the bill passed, and it would have another stop at Ways and Means uh, before I go to the floor. So there is some time here to get things clarified uh, to your satisfaction, hopefully. Not that you'd be satisfied, but maybe. Well, sir, my ways and means, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. you know folks that do. Okay, uh, Representative Lincheski and then Representative Anderson. Representative Lincheski. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, uh, you know, as somebody who was one of the people writing that legislation, um, you know, I, I won't try to convince you, Representative Lesh, but I think the, the amendment as stated, and I haven't read every nuance um, by Mr. Michael and Chair Davids, is accurate. Um, it was always the intent. Um, bipartisanly of everybody on the conference committee, which is where really where this got done, to allow the project to count their investments cumulatively, not starting at zero every year. And, and I should note, um, before you can accumulate the investment, you must first put in 200 million. So DEED was the group that we picked to sort of come in and say, uh, somebody has to prove to the state before they hand out a bunch of money that you've actually done what you've said. So DEED is the, legi is the uh, group that has to do that, not revenue. And, and I guess maybe that's the comment about not, you know, there not being tax implications and there certainly aren't uh, revenue implications on, on a revenue estimate for this piece of legislation. But there are, Mr. Chair, large tax implications for this legislation and any changes to it. And I think you are aware that there are a lot more changes than this being considered to that piece of legislation. And, you know, I guess, what I would, you know, ask you to consider is um, this This was not, you know, and maybe I missed it, but I went on the committee website and I did not see this amendment posted. And this bill, while I did listen to Representative Garofalo's committee hear it, um, I, you know, I, I don't honestly know why I ever went to that committee because it's a tax bill, but nonetheless, I listened to that testimony. It did get referred to here. So you have possession of House File, I believe it's 27. You know, why wouldn't we hear the bill? Um, you know, I, is there a reason that we wouldn't formally have a hearing on that bill rather than just look at it as an amendment to a federal conformity bill? Well, I, I am considering the A1 amendment, what we're doing right now is the hearing on House File 27. Uh, it, it is an amendment form, uh, but I want to get everyone down here that wants to testify on this. So this, I'm, I'm saying that this is the hearing, if you will, on House File 27 in amendment form. And again, you're on Ways and Means with me, um, and so we've got another stop to make uh, on this. Uh, but but your point is very well taken, Chair Lincheski. Mr. Chair. Chair Lincheski. If I may, just as a follow-up, I guess, you know, just this is process. It's not the content of the legislation, because I support the legislation, as, you're, um, as you talked about it, Mr. Chair. I agree with you. Um, but, you know, I just, when I, when I go to the floor, and I'm sure we all do this, you know, we look at the bill introductions each day, and... And I looked at them yesterday, and there are uh, about 16 bills that are tax bills, and they were sent to other committees. And that's okay because, you know, we often do that, but we usually make those chairs, send them back here, and then we actually formally hear them as a hearing with public testimony 
and authors at the table, et cetera, et cetera. So I just, you know, I guess one concern I would have that any one of these authors, and I was, I don't know where I put it, but I was writing them down, they've been sent to Ed Policy, Ed Finance, Health and Human Services, Veterans, you know, Jobs, the Jobs Committee, and, you know, should we expect in the minority that those bills are now just heard as amendments and they're not going to be heard as formal hearings? Um, because all those bills were sent to other committees too, and and we don't we're not properly we don't properly have that bill in front of us. So I'm just wondering if that's your intent or if this is just a unique circumstance that you feel is time sensitive. I, I think this is probably the latter rather than the former. But I would also say to your comments, I, I um, I'm not real bright, but my father did call me son, and I've learned a lot from you uh, in making sure that anything that has to do with taxes does come to the tax committee. Uh, and that's something I learned from you that that uh, I respect and, and I will do it. I have instructed staff, of course, uh, to seek out everything that would needs to come to the tax committee to come to the tax committee. Uh, it it will, goes the furthest place out first, and then you're going to hear this huge sucking sound as the bills come back to tax committee because uh, um, I've always agreed with your uh, position on that issue, and it will continue uh, for the next two years for sure. Uh, we want to make sure that if there's tax, because you know what happens. You get, you get tax issues here, 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 and it's like herding cats. You've got to bring them in. They've got to go through the tax committee, then probably next, of course, to Ways and Means after that before it gets floor. So we are looking very closely, and if we miss something, uh, I'd appreciate it if you would bring it to our attention, but we'll do the best we can from this end. Uh, but we may miss some, but not going to miss too many. It's, uh, uh, you're absolutely correct on that. Okay, um, uh, Chair Anderson. Okay, uh, Chair Graffalo. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Representative Lincheski, uh, you kind of asked why that bill went to my committee and the reason why, or the committee that I had the opportunity to chair, and the reason why is that as part of the DMC legislation, you'll note that um, it is, um, the public infrastructure project is not a business subsidy under section 116J.993. That's a pretty, that's a huge exemption to that statute of law. So for you and any other members, if anyone's even looking at touching DMC, because of that exception, they can expect that bill is going to go to the committee that I chair. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty blanket exception for every public disclosure on, on, corporate, on subsidies in general. That's why it went to my committee. Questions, Representative Earhart? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I don't know what uh, committee uh, Chairman Graffalo is chairing this year. I thought it was the Energy Commission. <laughs> Does that have anything to do with this? or? What's the name of your committee? Chair Graffalo. Uh, it's got a Chairman, long one. It's really long. Mr. Chairman, Representative Earhart, uh, it's my honor to chair the Job Growth, Energy Affordability Policy and Finance Committee. That's the short title. <laughs> <laughs> <Earth> Representative <laughs> Earhart. <laughs> short for patty cakes. Chair Graffalo, you got to think of a, like, something. <laughs> What's the acronym? I'm working on it. We're open to any suggestions. Okay. Well, Mr. Chairman, I just don't Earhart. understand why all the people on this committee who voted against this project last year are going to be able to turn around and and add to the fuel now. I don't know. Well, I, I'd just like to be very forthright on that, Chair uh, Earhart. The DMC legislation was not supported by some members on my side of the aisle. It was supported by other members on my side of the aisle, such as me and uh, the Rochester delegation and, and others. There were others that supported it. The reason we didn't vote for it and no offense, please, Chair Lincheski, uh, but it was in the 2013 tax bill, which our members felt did not wish to support. Uh, I even went so far as to talk to uh, Chair Lincheski. I wanted to vote for the bill, so because I wanted to be on the conference committee, I'll just be right up front. But I had to take the test, and the test is if I can go over to the Kelly Inn where I stay and take a shower and it's okay, then I'll vote for it. Uh, couldn't do it. Uh, so that being said, no members of our caucus voted for the 2013 tax bill, and, and no offense. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it was your tax bill and so forth. And the DMC was in that bill. So there were some of us that really wanted DMC to go by itself. But the chair's prerogative, I respect that, uh, pulled it in, and I probably done the same thing, come to think of it, uh, <laughs> pulled the DMC into the... In, into the tax bill, and uh, so that's that's where we're at on that. So back to House File Six uh, with the A1 amendment. Anyone in the Mr. Chairman? Oh, Representative Earhart. Sorry. It seems the same logic should apply uh, to this. That that should be flying by itself. 
as a bill, not as an amendment. Well, I may go into something known as chair tax phobia. <laughs> and that is when you take a, a separate bill, and this is something else I learned from Chair Lincheski, very rarely do you want to take a bill having to do with taxes to the House floor by itself. Uh, that can be a very dangerous thing. And, and what I'm hoping on this one is that I'm hoping I have the support to amend A1 on to 6 and that there's leadership uh, instructions or there, there's uh, direction from all leadership corners uh, that this bill go through unamended. Uh, that, that's, that's my hope. Representative Earhart. Well, you, Mr. Chairman, you, I think Representative Knobloch has been following along with some of his multiple things in, a, uh, in one, uh, too many things in one bill. And I, I don't know, you, I, were you successful in your latest efforts? Chair Knobloch. Chair David's Representative Earhart, no. Chair, Representative Earhart. <laughs> That's all, I just was wondering. Point. <laughs> <laughs> Point well taken, thank you. Uh, anyone from the audience that wish to testify for or against the chairman's prime piece of legislation for the year? <laughs> <laughs> okay, any other questions from members? Uh, if not, I will move the A1 amendment. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Motion prevails. Okay, we have House File 6 as amended, and I think we'll get to introductions here too. Oh, Chair Lincheski. Mr. Chair, just um, thank you. And uh, again, I do want to underline I do support the legislation that you added for <coughs> DMC, and I do believe, and, and I'm, I am utterly confused as to how the AG uh, attorney interpreted the legislation the way it did, but um, your language clarifies it. But I, I did want to ask you now that that's been adopted, is do you have an, uh, because I, I can't certainly speak for everybody here, but I support your federal conformity uh, legislation as well. Do you have an agreement with the Senate for the piece of this piece of legislation? I mean, I, you know, I know we heard from the commissioner that we want to fast track this. Is, has that been agreed to by the big three? Uh, it's been the big three. The big three. I, I don't have, just to be very clear to members, I don't have an okie dokie from all four leadership corners. Okay. I have worked very closely with Senator Scoy, uh, and he is fine with what we're doing. But that being said, I get how this place works, and there are, are other levels and issues. So <laughs> I cannot say that every caucus has signed off on it yet. Well, I would say that the Senate DFL has signed off on it. Uh, but the Republicans in the Senate in the DFL in the House, I have not, and I hope they do pretty quick. Otherwise, you know, I'm very sensitive and it would hurt my feelings if it didn't go through. So, with that being said, uh, any other discussion? If not, uh, I will recommend that House File 6, as amended, be <coughs> re referred to the Committee on Ways and Means. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all fair say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Thank you, members. Now, uh, item last which usually is item first, uh, would be uh, introductions. Uh, I'm ex very, very honored to be able to chair uh, this committee. Uh, what I'd like to do is go around uh, and make some introductions as to who we'll be working with. Uh, and the most important people first, uh, if we could get the pages to introduce themselves. I know Mike and... Hi, my name is Dominique Hudson. I am a committee page, and this is my first session. Um, I went to the University of Minnesota, graduated with a BA in Sociology of um, Law and Criminology, and my minor was poli sci. So, thank you, Mike. Or excuse me, Mr. Held. <laughs> Mike Held. I've been working for the House off and on since about 1999, and I'm doing rules. And today, I'm helping out uh, Chairman David's committee. Now, Mr. Held, do we know? No. We don't know no. what yeah. we're doing. There's okay. no permanent pages yet. Okay, thank you. Well, that, that will come shortly, but thank you for helping out today, and um, we'd be very honored if you could stick with us. Okay, uh, research, uh, DFL, partisan research. Excuse me, Richards or Richardson? Richard Sen. And you are certainly welcome to sit at the table, if that'd be easier, because it's kind of hard to sit in those chairs to write all the stuff down. So you're <coughs> more than welcome to join us at the table. Republican, uh, Mr. Gary Kay. Uh, 
I'm Derek Kay, GOP Research. This is my first session. Welcome. Welcome to the Tax Committee. Okay, I'd like to start with the fiscal staff. If you could please stand up and say who you are and what you've given the chairman today. Ms. Shell. Good morning. My name is Kathy Shell. I work with property taxes, and uh, so I'll be working not only with this committee but with the division as well. And yes, I'm responsible for the I Love Ohio State. I originate from Ohio. My family is all there. They're going crazy for this national tra championship, and that's the way to share it with you all. <laughs> okay, what, what I, I, I didn't really like the bumper stickers. Oh, it's Big Ten, so I, w I will admit I was cheering for Big Ten, but I actually am a huge fan of Mr. Bill. He's uh, <laughs> Mr. Bill. Miss <laughs> Templin. I am Cynthia Templin, House Fiscal, and I focus on state taxes. Okay, thank you. We'll be using those folks a lot. Uh, House uh, Research, nonpartisan. Uh, Joel Michael from House Research. I do corporate tax increment financing and what everybody else doesn't want to do. <laughs> <laughs> Nina Mansi, House Research, Individual Income Tax. Ms. Dalton? Or Mr. Hines, I didn't see you, Mr. Hines, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm Pat Dalton. Um, I do sales taxes, uh, aid to local governments, and lobby limits. Uh, Steve Hines, I do uh, property taxes. Yes, that's pretty much it. Christopher Clayman. I do tax, commerce uh, issues, more, I guess I'll know more as, as time goes on. This is my second day. <laughs> <laughs> He's new here. Um, and just, members, I'll have a bill outside my door that says that uh, house research and fiscal uh, are not allowed to ever retire. I hope you'll sign on that with me. Okay, if we could go, uh, let's go with tax staff. Let's kind of go here. Stephen Rubis, CA. Andrew Hasek, Tax CLA. Okay, so get to know these two folks. Uh, uh, every member needs to, to know these folks. And I'm very proud to announce our uh, vice chairman. Thanks, uh, State Rep Bob Barrett, third term, second term on the tax committee. Looking forward to the adventure. It, it will be an adventure. <laughs> Joe McDonald, Wright County, uh, third term. And what a pleasure. This uh, meeting has already been an adventure, so looking forward to more. Paul Torkelson, District 16B. Uh, last year I was lead, uh, or uh, yeah, lead on the property tax committee. Do you have Sleepy Eye in your district? I do have Sleepy Eye in my district, Mr. Chair. I went Chair. through there to Revere last night. It's a Lucky long you. Ways. Uh, Revere is no longer in my district. Oh, Representative who's that? Hamilton took that away from me in the redistricting it's a, effort. It's a nice town. And John Petersburg, I represent Oatana and Huasiga. Uh, Sarah Anderson, I represent Plymouth. Chris Wazinski, 16A, Lockaprow, Yellow Medicine, Lyon, and Redwood County. And I'm Diane Loeffler, and I represent Northeast and Northern Southeast Minneapolis. Linda Slocum, and I represent East and Central Richfield, and East, or, or West and Central Richfield, I better get it straight, and East and Central Bloomington, the suburbs. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Jim Knobloch, uh, representing St. Cloud and a couple of townships around it. Uh, in my seventh term, after a uh, long break here, I uh, was on the tax committee for a few other terms. I guess I don't recall uh, exactly how many anymore. Um, and I suppose since it is the tax committee, I should disclose that uh, although it has very, very, for a very long time been inactive, I actually do have a CPA shingle on my wall somewhere. Jennifer Loon from Eden Prairie. Ron Earhart, uh, most of the city of Edina. Is that still operable? I mean, do you still keep up on uh, mm -hmm. yearly uh, your shingle? Uh, not a chance, Representative Earhart. Okay. <laughs> uh, Representative Tom Hackworth, this is my first time on Texas. <clears throat> Jim Dabney, South Minneapolis. Uh, Carly Moline, portions of St. Louis and Itasca counties, third term, second term on taxes. Sandra Erickson, all of Mille Lacs County and parts of Sherburne and Kennebec. Mm. Uh, Ann Lincheskin, I represent Bloomington and Mr. Chair, I look forward to offering 
uh, all the work we can do together on our side of the aisle. And it's really, I think we've had a lot of fun together over the years. We've got a lot of good things done together last year, and I hope we will again this year. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Tom Anzels, Cast and Itasca. Eric, Eric Simonson, uh, represent the west half of Duluth. Uh, Lyndon Carlson, uh, being in some mentioned terms, 22nd term, elected in 72. Um, my very first term I was on the tax committee and uh, then I took a break for a few years and now several terms uh, ago I uh, rejoined the tax committee. Uh, the district I represent are um, parts of uh, Crystal, uh, New Hope and Plymouth. John Lesh, I represent a district in St. Paul from Como Park. It's my seventh or sixth term on taxes and I always pay my taxes. <laughs> Patrick Garofalo, and in my sixth term, I represent rural Dakota and Goodhue counties. John Kosnick from Lakeville. Anna Wills, I represent Apple Valley, Rose Mountain, Coates. I'm in my second term, but first term serving on the taxes committee, so happy to be here. Does Coates have a post office yet? I think they go through the Rosemont post office. Okay. Mr. Chief. Chair, uh, Representative Steve Draskowski, uh, I represent a portion of the Banana Belt of Minnesota. <laughs> Portions of Wabasha, Goodhue, Winona, and Dodge counties. Okay, thank you very much. Excuse me. Okay, a couple things here from the Department of Revenue, the legislative liaison, uh, Amy. Where's Amy? Okay, very important person for members of this committee. Uh, a lot of questions you'll be able to ask, Amy. Uh, have you ever been to Cogden, Minnesota? Did you know there was a Cogden? It's right on 14 before you get to Lamberton. About or is that it? Yeah, with a B, sir. That's in my district. <laughs> <laughs> Cobden, Minnesota. Fine city. Nothing to do with the man. Fine city. Okay. I just went by there. Okay. Uh, with that, anything else that needs to come before the committee? Uh, if not, uh, thank you, members, for your work today. Good government all the time. We're adjourned.